Hi, welcome to Think Tech. We are raising public awareness about globalism, energy, diversification, and technology. This is the Arts in Hawaii. I am your host, Donna Blanchard, very proud managing director of Kumukuhue Theater here in downtown Honolulu. We are broadcasting to you from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu. Um, and I want to remind you before we go any further that if you would like to make a question, uh, ask a question or make a comment during the show, you can tweet us at hashtag thinktechhi. Uh, and remember that we broadcast live every weekday. Uh, you can see our videos live at thinktechhawaii.com. You can also listen on Spreaker, uh, watch on Spreaker.tv and listen on um, or I'm sorry, I mixed that up. You can watch on Spreaker.tv and listen on Ustream.com. And if you would like links to any of our previous broadcasts, go to thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, My guest today is coming to us from New York, uh, New York City. She is on the phone with us. Her name is Natalia Paruz. She is affectionately known as the Saw Lady. She has spent over a decade bringing the rare art form of playing the music on a carpenter's saw to audiences around the world. Welcome, Natalia. Thank you. I am so tickled pink to be talking to you. I, let me tell our audience how we met. This is the first time we've okay. actually spoken to each other. Uh, um, a few weeks ago, I saw the movie Another Earth. And if you have not seen that movie yet, I strongly recommend that you check it out. It's on um, uh, Netflix and uh, Amazon. And I absolutely loved the movie. And I tweeted about it, that I loved the movie. And this wonderful woman, the Saw Lady, tweeted back to me, I'm the woman who plays the saw in that film. There's, there's a really lovely scene with some of the most gorgeous haunting music. I, I immediately jumped on it and said, I, I really want to have you on my show. She plays the saw. <laughs> what is the name of the piece that you played in that film, Natalia? Uh, well, it's just called Another Earth, the same as the oh. title of the movie, um, because it was composed for the movie. Ah, this makes sense. Okay. So um, tell us what, you, you have an amazing resume um, of places that you've played, including Carnegie Hall. <laughs> um, tell us, let's start off with what you are working on now. Right now I am working on a few different things. In some, some, most of the things that I do, I'm a hired musician, so I get to work in other people's projects. But right now, I have this idea of a um, trilogy of uh, music videos that I would like to produce. Um, in one of them, I will play the saw. In another one, I will play the bells. And in the third one, it will be like spoken word with probably saw and bells underneath. Um, and in all of them, I am a Victorian ghost. So for that, I need a costume of a Victorian ghost. And to, uh, I set about to getting that um, via this uh, show that I am about to play in. It's a theater show called Sawbones, and it's going to um, be put on stage in May in Manhattan. And they have one of the best costume designers <laughs> working on this show. So I asked them if um, instead of getting paid for my work for them, if I could get a costume made by their fabulous uh, costume designer. So this is how I'm combining now these two things, my own project together with this project that I, I'm just hired for. And hopefully it'll work out. <laughs> Fascinating. So you, you play the bells as well. I do, uh, not as much as I play the saw. The saw is my main instrument, but I do play two different types of bells, English hand bells, which have a very angelic sound, and pitch cow bells, which have a very happy, joyous sound. Oh, okay, cow bells. I don't think, where can, where can we go to hear that, or are we just waiting for the videos to come out? Uh, well, uh, on my CD, there is a track, I think it's the last track on the CD, it's um, called Delancey Street Rag, and those that's with cowbells. Oh, okay, okay. I, um, and uh, okay, what, okay. when I say cowbells, 
I mean, uh, I don't mean the percussion instrument known as cowbells, but rather real bells that were made to hang on cows' necks. <laughs> oh, okay, awesome. I have 65 of those uh, pitched in different, um, different sounds. <laughs> that is fascinating. When do you expect the video work to be done? Uh, well, first I gotta have my costume, and uh, then I will get after I do my work for this uh, this uh, stage show. So that is happening in May, and hopefully right after that I will get my costume and be able to get to work on my videos. <laughs> oh, okay. And the show happens in May in New York. Yes, that is correct. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you know, every now and then Hawaiian Airlines has really great deals on flights from direct from Honolulu to New York. So I will keep an eye out, on, <laughs> eye out for that Ooh. because I would love to come see you. Oh, thank you. That would be fabulous. I have watched. And I'll get to meet you in person. I know. That would be wonderful. I have, <laughs> we're going to actually show one of your videos here um, in, in a little while. Uh, I have watched them, and you, the, for the videos, you're playing in the New York subway. Yes. Do you do My this? My favorite place in the world. You do, this, you do this on a regular basis still? I do, yes, three times a week usually with permits from the MTA. A any particular stops that you usually go to? But my favorite stops are Times Square, Herald Square, and Union Square. Those are the biggest stations with lots of people, uh, lots of energy. Oh, yeah, fabulous. And do you, do you tweet where you are on any given day so people can find you? Um, I don't usually, if people uh, are visiting, I get a lot of people who visit New York from elsewhere and they tweet to ask me where I will be on that day and then of course I answer. So uh, if people want to know, they, they need to reach out to me and then I tell them. Okay. And why is playing in the New York subway your favorite place? Uh, for so many reasons. Uh, the most important reason is the fact that the people are right there with me when I play. See, when I play on a stage, I have stage lights in my eyes. I don't really see the audience, which is down there in the dark. It feels as if, it feels kind of lonely, you know, it feels there is, like a, there is a, a glass wall between me and the audience. But in the subway, the people are right there. I get to watch their faces as they walk by me. Um, they come and talk to me. There's such a great energy, like an exchange of energy between the people and me. And it's addictive. It's, uh, I'm, I'm totally addicted to that. I think that if, even if I get to be a millionaire or, uh, you know, win an Oscar award or whatever, I'll still want to play in the subway. That, uh, you know what, that fascinates me. And maybe it's because um, I w have I work as an actress, and the work that I enjoy the best is straight-up traditional stage work. And it mm -hmm. seems to me that what you're doing, you have so much more vulnerability that close, that close to that your audience. That is true. That is true, yes. I mean, uh, you have to have a lot of guts. <laughs> you meet a lot of people from uh, from homeless people to uh, Wall Street tycoons and everybody in between, and it, you get to learn a lot about human nature. I mean, some people will be very nice and some people won't, and you have to learn to deal with that. And you have to be a person who really loves people in order to uh, to survive on the street. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So. Have you had to develop something of a tough exterior? Uh, well, remember that I had a saw with me, so... <laughs> <That's true. laughs> that helps! <laughs> Gets me a lot of respect on the street. Um, but I have learned a lot from playing in the subway. Uh, the one thing which uh, the subway changed me with is I used to be very shy and it's thanks to the subway that I learned to open up to people because, see, when you play um, in the subway, people, like, come by and they, they expect you to play. So, like, they would come and, and, like, if I was taking a break, people would come and, like, stand in front of me and be like, okay, let's, let's see you, let's, you know, play. They don't, don't let you, like, um, shy away or, and they come and talk to you. So, you, 
you have no choice but to answer back because they are they are looking at you expecting an answer and it just it taught me to open up and it taught me that basically people are usually really really nice like when i started i used to be scared more of people and like i would see let's say a person approaching me that would look scary and, and I would think, oh, he's going to give me a hard time, you know, he's going to maybe try to steal from me. And 99.9% .9 of the time, those scary-looking people turn out to be the nicest, kindest, sweetest people in the world. So the subway really taught me not to judge people by what they look like and that most people are really nice. <laughs> what? an awesome thing to do three times a week to commune uh, with every people from every walk of life you see in the subways right it's such a privilege and to supply the soundtrack to the city the city's life i mean it's it's a huge privilege <laughs> now you, you say that you used to be shy tell me about how it happened that you for the first time sat down in the subway with your saw and started playing. How did that happen? Ah, well, I didn't start in the subway. I started on the street. And the way it happened it was I used to have this job at the Broadway theater selling souvenirs. And there was a lot of free time on that job because I only had to work when pe the audience walks in, walks out, and during intermission. But in between, I was free to do whatever I wanted. So I used to bring the saw to work with me, and I used to sit in the parking lot adjacent to the theater and practice. And I meant to not disturb anybody. I sat in the remote corner of the parking lot just practicing. But one day, a man and his son came and stood next to me for a long time listening. And then the man put his hand in his pocket, took out a $5 bill, and handed it to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like huh? Why are you giving me money? And he said, well, we really enjoyed hearing you play, and we want to show our appreciation. I thought that was wild. So I ran into the theater to tell my friends what happened, and they were like, oh, you have to go and play in front of the theater during intermission, because that's when all the buskers come, all the street performers. And I was like, no, no, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for performing, and you know, but my friends would not take no for an answer for me. And not during our intermission, because we all had to work during our intermission. But the theater next door to us, the show was a different length, so the intermission was at a different time. My friends dragged me out and sat me down in front of that theater. They put an empty box in front of me. One of them put a dollar bill in the box, and then they all stood back to see what would happen. <laughs> So I had no choice. The audience started coming out, you know, all the smokers come out during intermission. And I started to play, and people gathered around, and they were clapping, and they were smiling. And then they started putting donations in the box. And at the end of the 10-minute intermission, there was as much money in that box as I was making at work that day. So that's when I decided, hmm, maybe I shouldn't be practicing on the remote corner of a parking lot. Maybe I should be practicing on the street. And that's how I got started in street performance. That's how you got to the street. Okay, okay, we're going to take a, a really quick break here, Natalia, and we're going to come back and um, get back into that conversation. This is The Arts in Hawaii. I'm Donna Blanchard, and I am talking with the Saw Lady, Natalia Paruz. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia In Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, we're back. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. I am Donna Blanchard, your host and very proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater. Today, I am talking with the Saw Lady, Nat Natalia Peruz. She is joining us uh, by phone from New York. And she plays music on a carpenter's saw. 
Uh, and you may have heard her on um, the film um, Another Earth. Uh, so you, st you started playing on the street, and then uh, it was just a natural step to go to the subway in the winter, I would imagine it was. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Rain, snow, and I didn't want to stop playing, so I ventured down into the subway. And the first thing that happened when I played in the subway was I noticed the acoustics, which is phenomenal. And I can tell you, I have played in some of the best uh, uh, concert halls in the United States. The acoustics in the subway is even better. And for a musician, Playing in good acoustics is such a treat that I never wanted to go back up on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. The acoustics in the subway are better than Carnegie Hall. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Because it's because um, the way the subway is shaped uh, and the materials from which it is built, it's as if you're playing in a cave, and the walls are not. It's not like a square. There are all these caverns. So when you play, the sound hits the wall and ricochets over to the other wall, but it's in a slight angle. So it creates a natural reverb, and also it augments uh, the volume of the sound naturally. And it's, it's just it's phenomenal. Do you think, I would imagine that this beautiful, uh, haunting and, and sweet music that you play must change the mood in that cavernous room? Do you think so? It is. It, it's true. It is a very relaxing sound. Um, and I think for a city as busy and as stressful as, as New York City, it's a good thing. It, it calms people down, uh, lets them sort of recharge their batteries. Um, I think it's working out well. So <laughs> I bet it is. It would make me stop. <laughs> I w uh, yeah, it would make me stop in my tracks and hope to see you the next day. Um, so, Natalia, let's talk about how you initially came to the saw. You used to be a dancer, didn't you? That is correct, yes. I um, was with a Martha Graham, uh, I was a trainee with the Martha Graham um, Dance Company, and I was also um, performing in different musicals, and I was a tap dance teacher. Um, but that all came to an end due to a car accident. And um, I, I suffer a permanent injury to my upper spine, which uh, fortunately I, I can walk, I can run, but uh, I can't dance. Um, the, the range of motion in my upper body is uh, completely damaged. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was very devastating when that happened because... All my life until then, I was just eating, breathing, sleeping, dance. That was my life. And all of a sudden, it was taken away from me. How old were you? Uh, well, uh, that was about, let's say, um, close to uh, 19, something like that, close to 20. Oh, my goodness. And Well, it looks like, from what I've seen on your videos, playing the saw is a very physical. It is, yes. Uh, I mean, you're bending steel, <laughs> so it is very physical. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's different from dance because, um, you know, I don't have to bend backwards. I'm sitting down when I play, so. Uh, okay, okay. So you lost the ability to dance. And by the way, you don't do anything small. When you danced, you were with Martha Graham. I mean, uh, that, that's quite an accomplishment at such, such a young age to be in that Thank company. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so how did you come to the saw, though? Well, after the accident, uh, like you can imagine, I was devastated, and I didn't know what to do with my life. So um, my parents wanted to cheer me up, and they took me uh, on a trip to Europe. They took me to Austria. Why? Because when I was a kid, I loved the movie The Sound of Music. I watched it like 14 times. <laughs> I was a total groupie of that movie. And it was filmed in Austria. So my parents figured that if they take me there to the places where 
um, it was filmed, they would cheer me up. And they were right, it did cheer me up. Mm -hmm. But what happened while we were there was we went to see a show for tourists. And in this show, part of it was this man playing a saw. And that was the first time that I've encountered this art form. And it was also the first time since the accident that I actually felt excited about something other than dance. I saw that performance and I was like, ah, I, I was mesmerized. I, I, I felt like I had to learn to play it. Wow, that's that's incredible. You had one of those you had one of those moments coming out of a time of such devastation in your life. And it can't be yeah. easy it can't be easy to learn. I mean, it you make it look easy to do, but uh, how, did you receive training? Uh, no, what happened was I went backstage to talk to that saw player and I asked him if I could schedule a lesson with him and he said no. And of course, I offered to pay him. He said, "No." Why? He said, "Go he... home." He said, "Go home. Pick up a saw, like you know, from a hardware store, and imitate what you remember me doing on stage, and figure it out." <gasps> so that's what I did. <laughs> wow! So you I went out borrowed, and got a, I, a saw and a bow. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. First, I borrowed a saw from somebody because I didn't want to invest money in something that I might end up not knowing what to do with. So I borrowed a hand saw from somebody who was using it for woodwork, and I got a bow, and I imitated what I remembered, and through trial and error, I basically reinvented the wheel, if you will. <laughs> and, oh uh, yeah. Did you have any musical... Uh, background before then? Or had you played another instrument before then? I did. When I was a kid, uh, like when I was four, I, I started learning a recorder. When I was six, my mother taught me to play piano. I took some guitar in elementary school. I sang in a choir. So yes, I had some background. I had the bass for it. You know, I, I can read music, sheet music. So that was that was a good training in preparation. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Still, you have to have an incredible ear. You do, yes. Uh, for playing the saw, you do, because there's no indication on the blade as to where the notes are. And even when you play the note, there are all these, like, quarter tones that surround each note that it's it's difficult to hit the note in the center you know it's not like a piano where you hit the key and that's the note with the saw you have to like it's as if you're constantly tuning while you're playing oh. so oh. That, maybe that's why there aren't that many saw players it's too difficult <laughs> it's yeah <laughs> it sounds like it is so now how many years have you been playing Oh, many, many years. Uh, about 18, 19 years. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, we're um, before we go to the next break, we're going to go to a video of you playing in the subway. And I, <laughs> I, I it's just kind of magical, not only the, the music, the atmosphere, but you have just this look of bliss on your face when you play. <laughs> You, it, it's really, it's really moving to watch. I um, well, thank you. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, Ian. I see that we've got this queued up. Are you ready to go on that? Okay, we're going to go to that now, Natalia, and I'm, we'll, we'll talk more after the break. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear it, I can see it.
Michael Horry for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Hi, we're back. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series. I'm Donna Blanchard, and we're talking with Natalie per Natalia Perus, who plays the Carpenter Saw. And that was a video that you just saw going into the break. And while you were enjoying the video, uh, we were chatting here, and um, Ian said, he was pretty awestruck at how cool it is, but he, um, Natalia was talking about the fact that you are, you're moving the saw, but also the placement of the bow is different for the notes, correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, the lower I bend the blade towards the floor, the closer to the tip of the blade I have to bow in order to make the sound. Oh, okay. And does the does the sound of the of the saw change depending on humidity and the weather temperature that sort of thing oh yes <laughs> it certainly does when it's humid it's very difficult to play uh, not to mention the fact that also the saw rusts from the humidity um, and when it's cold the metal doesn't vibrate as fast so it's like forcing the blade to play, and I actually broke two saws that way, playing in uh, like you know freezing conditions in the subway. Um, I can actually say that I broke steel. Oh my goodness! Wow, that's even more than breaking glass. <laughs> yeah, that's a big deal. So it gets that you know I. Um, lived in Chicago for 10 years and I rode the trains there a lot and I, I don't remember it ever getting that cold when you were down under you know does it really um, it gets cold enough evidently it got cold enough to break steel with a bow yeah uh, it depends on which station uh, for example today I played at Herald Square and that's a station where it's always warmer uh, so it's 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 good but in other stations such as Times Square it gets really cold um, so it depends on on the location oh, okay so can you, Natalia can you talk a little bit about when when you are playing and you, you said on the break that they get a show watching you but you also get a show watching them and you can see from the smiles on those people's faces that it is it makes their day that they get a chance to both see you and listen to you um, but well uh, <laughs> it makes my day to see them that's this exchange of energy that I was talking about before um, it's uh, I really feed on that because it's it's um, you know if you just play um, on a stage you don't get that same energy and so you get tired perhaps more quickly in the subway I find that I can play like six hours nonstop and I don't get tired I mean yeah after six hours I am tired but you know up to that point and it's because of, of this incredible energy that I get from from the people it's magical Wow are you well and that's the definition of you know performing within your passion that time just gets away from you yeah. Yes. And you could just go and go. Now, when you're playing, so so I'm thinking as a stage actress, man, if I was looking in the in the f eyes of the people for whom I'm performing and really recognizing that loop, it would be very distracting to to, to my to me within my art form. And I'm wondering if you ever reach moments in which the concentration required for a given piece makes you sort of put up that fourth wall. Do you find that that happens? Um, if it is a difficult piece to play, then yes. If it is a piece where I need to really concentrate, 
to be like precisely in the center of the notes, then yes, then I find myself saying to myself, okay, look down at the solo now, don't look at the audience and concentrate on what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, but with music that is easy to play, particularly songs, um, it's, you know, it's easy enough that I, well, I trained myself to multitask, if you will, play while interacting with the audience. And sometimes I actually practice that because sometimes people come and talk to me while I'm playing. And that is, that is uh, difficult, you know, it's dist uh, destructing. But um, I make a point of trying to talk to them, answer them while continuing to play. And I find that that's good training because afterwards, if you're on stage and no matter what happens, let's say uh, some part of the scenery falls down or whatever happens, you're trained to go on with the show no matter what. Yeah. Well, and mo is, is most of the music, that that's incredible. I uh, like to strum on my ukulele in my evenings at home, but oh, cool. I, I can't imagine. It would be very difficult for me to carry on a conversation with someone while I was doing that. Um, that is difficult, yeah. Yeah. I, so is most of the music that you are playing, it, it is written, it's composed, or are you ever just freestyling? Um, usually it's composed. I mean, in the subway, it's, it's usually composed pieces. But I have done um, uh, different types of uh, performances where it was improvisation. For example, I played for these two horror shows um, where a cello player and myself, we were the orchestra for these two shows, and it was completely improvised from beginning to end, and uh, the music part, I mean, and it was really cool to uh, improvise to the acting. It was really fun. Huh, that, yeah, that would be cool. And I, I think the music is absolutely beautiful, but I have to use the word haunting to describe it, so I can definitely see how, if I were going to write a horror film, I would love to <laughs> hire you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's something, well, like I said, uh, while I was playing it in the office, the office manager said he kept except, expecting someone to come up behind him, <laughs> kept expecting <laughs> something to happen while this music was playing. Um, so how did the bells come about? How did you decide to get into that? Uh, how did what? I'm sorry? The, the bells, when you started playing oh, the bells. bells. Ah, uh, how did that start? Oh, yes. Okay, on that same trip to Austria that I told you about before, uh, we rented the car, we were driving, and on, on our way to a lot of uh, uh, meadows with cow herds, and in Austria, they put bells on cows' necks. And I noticed as we were going, the, the uh, car window was rolled down, so I, I heard the sound of the bells as the cows were walking. And I said to my parents, huh, this is interesting. Each herd has a different pitch to their bell. So I got this idea that I am going to collect um, like uh, all the different pitches um, and try to make an octave of notes with those bells. So I went to all the souvenir stores that we could find on our way and I, I tried out all the different bells and I collected one octave. And then in the hotel room, I started playing Happy Birthday to You on those bells <laughs> and it worked. So that's how I, uh, I got the idea. And then uh, through the years, I added more and more bells until now I have 65 bells. And uh, yeah, and I play mostly ragtime music on those cowbells because um, their, their nature fits it. They have a very happy, like jolly type of sound. And then from, from those bells, um, I was performing with these bells and uh, there was this old lady who kept coming to all of my gigs and every time she would come see me um, after the show and she would tell me, you have to go to Trinity Church because they have handbells and you will love it. Finally, <laughs> after um, uh, many months of her telling me about those bells at this church, I actually did go to the church and I fell in love with handbells there. And so that's how I got introduced to handbells. <laughs> 
Man, that that was really uh, quite a pivotal trip you had to Austria. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that at, at such a young age for you to have been that moved. I, did you ever think about how uh, you know that that was uh, that was a while ago in your life? How many dis life decisions that I don't know you made or you felt like were made for you at such a tender age? Yes, you know it's 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 exactly like that. I sort of feel as if um, you know the proverb when God closes a door, somewhere He opens a window. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I felt like. I felt like. Somebody up there, you know, you can call it God or Providence or, or fate, whatever you want to call it, was pointing the way to me and like saying, oh, you think you, you were supposed to be a dancer? Well, guess what? You were wrong. This is actually what you are meant to be doing. And somehow this force ushered me into this new life and new career that now in retrospect I can say that Okay, it's going to sound really weird that I say this, but in a way this accident turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me because if it didn't happen, I would probably still be a dancer, still in the dance world today, and I would have missed out on so much mm. um, that, you know, it's like something other than me somewhere knew better than me what, what I was meant to be doing. Awesome. I don't think that sounds weird at all. I think that is incredibly inspiring. I, I have no doubt that you are a beautiful dancer, but what the work that you do on the saw is so singular. I, I did a little research. I cannot find anyone in Hawaii who plays the saw. There can't be too many. Huh. <laughs> yeah, there. I, I found some older music that had been recorded that was saw, and there was one group that was saw and banjo. And they called cool. themselves bittersweet, <laughs> I think. But I huh. couldn't find anyone currently doing that work. And there you, is... You know, there is, there is Hawaiian guitar, mm -hmm. and that is kind of like a sliding guitar, and it has a sound that is very similar to the sound of the saw. So um, the slack you know, I, I think key? that, like... I'm sorry? Slack, slack key guitar, is that what you're thinking of, maybe? Maybe that's what what is called over there. I don't know. Um, I know it is Hawaiian guitar. Oh. Uh, it's like a sliding guitar. You play it by. Uh, you don't hold the guitar like against your body, but you you put it in your lap and you play it. And um, it's. I don't know. It's used a lot in in like Hawaiian traditional, like folk uh, songs. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's like key. Hey, um, Natalia, we need to take another quick break. Ian, will it be possible to listen to a little of the music from her CD as we go into the break? Oh, okay. Uh, he's going to play, be playing some of her music right now as we're getting ready to go into the break. I think that you were talking about slack key, slack key guitar. Um, by the way, Natalia, we are going to take a break now. This is the Arts in Hawaii. I am Donna Blanchard, proud managing director of Kumukuhua Theater and host of this show. We're talking to Natalie per Natalia Peruse, who is the saw lady, and this is her playing the carpenter saw. Enjoy, and we'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. Hi, we're back and we're live. This is the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series coming to you from Pioneer Plaza in the heart of downtown Honolulu. Um, we're going to, I hope you've been enjoying listening to the music. We are in just a couple of minutes going to hear Natalia playing live 
I'm kind of excited about that. And this is new for us here, so bear with us as we work with the technology on this. Um, so, uh, Natalia, what do you see? I, I uh, got some information that I, I think you had sent me this bio on yourself, and I just want to read the last paragraph that I've got here. Uh, Natalia's goal is not only to preserve the rare art form of playing music on the saw, but to also try to push it forward through the invention of better playing technique, fine-tuning the instrument, educating composers about the possibilities of composing for saw, and bringing the instrument to public awareness. Um, and you've also commissioned a number of new works for the musical saw from contemporary composers. That, that's, that's quite a wonderful goal that you got there. Can you talk a little bit about um, the ways in which you are making this happen? Uh, well, uh, the bringing it to public awareness part, uh, playing in the subway really helps um, in that direction. Um, I find that when I started to play the saw, hardly anybody knew what it was, and people would come to me and ask me if I've invented this art form, which I haven't. It's like 300 years old. Um, and now when I play, um, I'm happy to report that people actually come and they know what it is, and I hear them saying to one another, like one person wouldn't know, and another person would say to them, oh, it's a saw, it's a, car, it's a musical saw. So it's, it proves that playing in the subway is a, an educational tool um, as well. Um, I do introduce the saw to uh, composers of today. Uh, many people don't know about the saw, and e even those who do know about it, they usually hear it uh, like in folk music, uh, in country music, so they're not aware of all of its possibilities. Uh, for example, some people, some composers think that the saw can only slide from, from note to note, but actually um, one can go directly from note to note, avoiding the slide. Um, and other uh, technical aspects. So um, I always enjoy introducing composers to the abilities of the saw and thus getting them to write uh, more complicated music for it. Um, as far as fine tuning the, uh, the instrument, um, I have worked with a few people who um, produce uh, saws and um, better uh, metal is now being used uh, for saws that are made especially for music. Um, the shape of the blade, uh, the tapering of it, the width of it, um, everything contributes to uh, the, the sound production. And so today we actually have really good saws that are made for music, uh, which make playing easier. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's an art form that is definitely developing. Wow, and you are playing a major role in that. I, um, I, I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to talk with you. I don't. I want to make sure that we have time for you to play. We've got about six minutes left. Do you? Could you play for us huh. for about three or four minutes so we have time to? Then we'll have a little time to wrap up. That's uh, a bit long. I thought that I would play for like you know a minute. You do whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, so I'm going to put the receiver down now. Okay. Because I need to uh, hold the, the saw and the bow in my hands. Okay.
Could you hear that? Oh, it was beautiful. That was awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That just, uh, everyone here in the studio is uh, <laughs> really enjoying it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And no wonder, I, d I do want to mention, I mentioned that you would played um, Carnegie Hall. I want to also mention that you've played with the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Zubin Mehta, no less. Um, the Westchester right. Phil, uh, Philharmonic, the Royal Air Moroccan Symphony Orchestra. You've played at um, Lincoln Center. Um, you let's see. You've uh, appeared on Good Day New York, Good Morning America, um, MTV VH1, um, and PBS on New York Voices. And you performed on A Prairie Home Companion. That was fun. I, I love that show. <laughs> I have a weakness in my heart. I'm a Lutheran from Indiana. I have a weakness in my heart for, for that show. Um, you know, it's interesting that you're saying that you're a Lutheran because in my research of the history of the musical soul, I came across obituaries of Lutheran priests from like 200 years ago. And a surprising number of them in their, their obituaries, it said, Pastor so and so used to play the musical saw leading the congregation in the singing of hymns. And I actually spoke with a really old uh, Lutheran pastor, and he said that he actually remembers that there was a Lutheran pastor who originally came from Norway who played the saw, so he confirmed this uh, to me. I don't know why uh, Lutherans, but it seems to be. Um, you know, a thing from, from the past in the Lutheran Church. Oh, my goodness. Did you tell Garrison yeah. Keillor that? <laughs> <laughs> that? That's interesting. Maybe I'm drawn to it by, uh, yeah. I don't know, by through your genes. Through culture, <laughs> through my genes. That's why it sounds, I think it sounds, uh, well, and we can tell from your videos of the people watching you that uh, it, it's not just us Lutherans who are. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm so glad that you are doing this work, and I look forward to... Someday I'm going to come to New York, and I'm going to seek you out. I'm going to... Oh, wonderful. See you in the I'm subway I'm looking forward train. to that. Um, and if you ever want to come out to Hawaii, let us know. We don't have any subways here, but we can find some acoustics somewhere for you. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Uh, thank you so much, Natalia, and I will um, stay in touch with you and keep an eye on you on Twitter and Facebook. Oh, yeah, your Saw thank Lady you. on, tw on uh, Twitter, your Saw Lady. And, That's um, right. Facebook, I think if you put in Saw Lady, you come up. And if not, then my name, or Natalia Peru. Natalia I will Peruse. definitely come up. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to have to wrap up now. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you for Thank you for having me on your show. It's been awesome. Next next time we got to Skype you in. I want to see you playing it too. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, um, I'm Donna Blanchard of Kumukuhua Theater. The show has been the Arts in Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series. I would like to thank our production manager, Ian Davidson, who is in my ear and who we gave a little bit of a workout to today. I would also like to thank our communications director, Chrissy Goffigan, and Jay Fidel, who somehow manages to put it all together. If you would like to see um, view our archives, go to thinktechhawaii.com. You can find that information there, as well as a schedule of upcoming shows. And um, you can uh, 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 follow us on, on uh, Facebook. Check us out on Twitter. That's ThinkTech um, HI on Twitter and ThinkTech Hawaii on Facebook. Next week, my guest is Jeremiah Wubbin, who is a beer maker. We're going to be talking to him. He's quite an artist and a chemist as well. We'll see you next week. Bye.